Hey everybody, this is Lori White with Remax Southern Shores coming to you uh, from my home studio, my, my office. And today um, for this uh, Facebook Live, we are going to talk about short sales. And with me today is uh, attorney Steve Wild of the Wild Law Firm. And I will let him sort of introduce himself and give a little biography of what Steve's all about. Steve. Hi, my name is Steve Wild, Wild Law Firm. All we do is short sales, believe it or not. We've been doing short sales now for 10 years. We've done thousands of short sales and we do them primarily in North and South Carolina. That's you, our major market. Do other states? Are you able to do other states besides North and South Carolina? Yes, because the short sale is actually the same animal, the same thing in Alaska as it is in South Carolina. There is no difference. It's the same people. It's the same everything. The closing is different in every state. Right. But I'm not a closing attorney, thank God. <laughs> uh, I don't close in North Carolina. I don't even if I'm doing a short sale on a house two doors up from my office, I'm not the closing attorney. I work for the buyer and the seller to get that deal done under those terms or the best terms that we can get. So um, but yeah, North South Carolina primarily. Uh, my only requirement when I do go into another state, and South Carolina is not a big deal because they do this, um, is I require uh, a closing attorney in the deal. You know, I don't want to be the only one that's a license if I'm doing a short sale that has a license. Um, if I'm doing a short sale in Ohio, I am not an Ohio licensed attorney. I have, an, gotcha. I have a license in California and in North Carolina. Um, and I have permission in most of these other states to do this. So it's not a big deal, but I don't want to be the only one with a license. So my requirement is I want to see a closing attorney there in case there's some issue. I want, you know, someone there and, and not that title companies don't do great jobs at closing. It's just for a short sale. Let's get it. Let's get a, an attorney in it. That's my only requirement. That's actually one of the, one of the questions I have going forward. So my first question for you is, do you think that uh, what is happening now is going to cause an influx of short sales down the line? No one knows for sure, but I don't see how we avoid it. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are two aspects that bring short sales to the fore. I mean, we always have short sales. So short sales were huge and then they trickled off. But in every market, even a hot market, there are short sales when someone is underwater on the property and has to sell. Those are the two elements that we have to look for. Are there going to be short sales? Number one, are we going to have a little dip in the market? And you don't necessarily have to have a dip in the market, but that's when you see a lot more short sales when a lot more people go underwater. Mm -hmm. uh, or we just stop because a lot of people have been leveraging all the way up and expecting it to go up forever and it doesn't then er, you know and then they don't have seven percent on top of what they borrowed six percent mm -hmm. real estate commission taxes and tax stamps so underwater they're going to be underwater whether it's because they over leveraged or because the market dipped a little bit that's number one just because you're underwater doesn't mean you have to do a short sale the other element is do i have to sell Mm -hmm. That's that's what is going to be a bigger part of this, I think, than than necessarily the dip in the market. This isn't 2008. I don't think we're going to have this huge drop in the market. We may have some. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see how we don't when a lot of properties come on the market right now. In a lot of markets, probably like yours, there's a lot. There's not enough inventory. Correct. So we're really we have here unless we have a lot of places. So the fact that more come on the market doesn't mean anything. But if a lot come on the market, then you're going to have a dip. The other one, like I said, is do they have to sell? You know, right. and that's what we're going to see. People lose their job and that whole business went away and they didn't get a job and they have to move and, and get a right. job from another location or do something. And, you know, so that's going to be the driver, I think, in this particular uh, time is having to sell. Gotcha. So when, when a homeowner um, is starting to think that they could possibly um, be underwater because like you say, they, they leveraged their home to buy a business or whatever they did. And now, and now their home is not worth all of the money that they owe to, to one lender, two lenders, wh whatever it might be. Or What's an IRS first? tax lien or a judgment or all of them. Right. Well, right. What is the first step for, for that homeowner when they think that they, they might be in trouble and might need to talk about a short sale? Well, they can call me anytime, but one of the requirements for a short sale is you have to have a real estate agent. So okay. my first phone call would be to you, to a real estate agent who will do a net sheet for me. 
you know, mm -hmm. if, I'm the, if I'm the seller, then I'm going to say, well, I got a first, I got a second. And I got this little judgment out there from a credit card. And I do have an IRS tax lien from three years ago. <laughs> you need to know all that because those all have to be paid at closing. And then you do a net sheet and you say, I'm sorry to say that you're, you're underwater. Um, you're underwater on the, on the second, but maybe not on the first, depending on what we have or you, you know, whatever it is. But if you're underwater, then it's going to be a short sale. The only options are a short sale, a deed in lieu of foreclosure and a foreclosure, and they gradually get much worse. So the mm -hmm. short sale is their best option. And at that point, you just send them to me and I will have a free consultation with them for an hour and a half and we'll go over all of that, what the game plan is, what they need and, mm -hmm. uh, and answer all their questions. The main thing is to calm them down and get them back sleeping at night because mm -hmm. they're all freaked out about this. And, right, and right. once you understand all the aspects of it, it's like, oh, that's not so bad. That's and right. I'll answer that for free because that also is a, is a concern. People are afraid possibly to even talk to anybody because they can't afford to pay them anything. So that um, that that's a, a great, great thing that you do for, for folks to try to shed some light on the situation that they may be in. So I love that. Um, and you, I, you sort of answer the next question. Do they need to have a realtor or can they do a FISBO? You, uh, you answer that. You can't do a FISBO. You want, it has to be on the market, exposed to the market by, a, by a, a real estate agent in the MLS and all of that sort of stuff. So that's a requirement, um, okay. which, which is great because then you get the, the experience and the professionalism and all the good stuff that comes with uh, working with you with real estate agents. Um, and you don't have to pay for it because the bank pays for that. The bank yeah. is going to pay the 6% real estate commission. They're going to mm -hmm. pay the taxes. They're going to pay the tax stamps. And they're probably going to pay me. I don't even have an upfront fee when I take on a short sale. I don't have an upfront fee just like you. I don't get paid unless we close. So I'm betting on myself mm -hmm. and, and, and us that we're going to get this through. And if we do, we go to the closing table. That's when I get paid. And most of the time, I'm going to get the bank to pay me through closing costs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I, the short sales that we have done and we've done dozens together over the years. Uh, I've not, I've not had um, a seller have to come to the table with money uh, unless they have money that they're just, you know, they just are short selling, but they've got money to come to the table with maybe a small amount or maybe not, or, or sometimes nothing at all. And they just, they just wash their hands and they're done. Most of the time it's not, most of the time my goal is to get these people out, get their deficiencies forgiven and, 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 and with no no cash at closing, if we can talk about that. For, talk yeah. about the deficiencies for a minute. What what that means? Okay. Getting that forgiven. The deficiency is the amount that you still owe. So let's just take us a, a, a simple simple. You have a first mortgage and nothing else, and you owe three hundred thousand on it, but the property is only worth two hundred ninety thousand dollars. So you're going to be underwater ten thousand dollars plus another seven percent or 8%, 7%, something like that. So you're $20,000 or so underwater. That's the deficiency at the end of the day. And it keeps getting bigger every month because every month that you don't pay, that amount goes on to the amount that you owe. So at the end of the period um, of, 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 a, of, uh, of the short sale, of, of going through the process of a short sale, at the end of that period, you go to closing, how much do you owe and how much are they getting? And then there's a difference. That's the deficiency. And we want to get that forgiven if we can. Okay. They have three options. They can forgive that debt. Number one, that's what we want. That's what we go in with. Um, they could ask you for a cash contribution, a cash mm -hmm. contribution, something like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. They're going to ask for a big cash contribution and we'll probably get them down to a very small cash contribution. Okay. But there will be a, a conversation in that type of loan with a cash contribution. That just means you bring a thousand dollars to closing and they forgive the other 20, something like that. There's an example. Of that. For sure. Or small bank, they're going to, they're going to want to their money back. You know, they don't right. have the ability to just forgive. So we know that up front. And that's what the consultation is about. We're going to look at everybody and say, well, these are what the, this is what these loans are going to do because we've got all this experience. We know that this credit union is not going to forgive the debt. The best we're going to get is, is, a, is a promissory note at the end. And so they're prepared for what's coming. We're not promising them something that that, mm -hmm. that happen. And it's possible to do a, do a successful, complete a successful, successful short sale with multiple creditors. Isn't that correct? Oh yeah, we do that all the time. 
um, the first thing we're going to do is 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 analyze. Is it even is it even short with the first? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times it's not short with the first and you see people that don't really understand short sales. They waste six months trying to get a short sale with a first and the first isn't even short. Mm -hmm. and I think people go into foreclosure because they're all messing around with the wrong people. So you want to see what you have, what the way through. There's always a way through. It may be a rocky way. It may be a, a, a clean, smooth way, but there's always a way through and you want to analyze that. So the first, are they short? And if there's a second, then you've got two short sales. Right. Two of documents, two short sales going on at the same time. If you have an IRS tax lien, well, that's not a, a third short sale, but, but you've got to get the approval from both short sales and you have to have an appraisal showing that you've got a market price offer. Then you can go to the IRS and it takes about 20 days to get that. Okay. It's interesting. And HOA fees, what if there are delinquent HOA fees? How are those handled in a short sale? You know, if there's one thing, when someone comes to me and we have a consult, they said, should I make my payments? And we'll talk about that. The one thing that I always say you should be paying is your homeowners association. If you don't pay your insurance, well, your first mortgage, your first loan will get notified that, hey, your insurance is about to, to uh, um, go in default and, and they'll put their own insurance on it. So it'll, you don't have to really worry about that. At the end of the year, if you don't pay the taxes, usually the first mortgage will pay the taxes because they don't want a chance a tax sale under undermining their position here. So they will pay those. But the homeowners association, that's the one thing that I think it's the fair thing to do and the right thing to do is to pay that as the seller, um, as the homeowner. Some people can't. Some people are a year behind and it's and they've got an assessment and it's this ten thousand um, uh, dollar bill that they've got to pay that has to be paid at closing or there's no there's no there's no closing so we know that i'm going to take that ten thousand dollars and i'm going to ask the, the the lender to pay for it depending on who the lender is we might get some money for it depending on how big it is maybe it's just a couple thousand dollars maybe we'll get them to pay that if it's ten thousand dollars it's unlikely that we're going to get them to pay that but i'm going to get as much as i can from that but we need to have someone in the deal, the seller or the buyer, um, usually that that has their hand up and says, OK, do what you can, Steve. But at the end of the day, I will pay the homeowners association because if you don't have that hand up, you know, the likelihood of us getting the bank to pay ten thousand dollars on that one is is pretty low. Right. You, you're wasting your time. You need to have a plan for everything. So you need to think ahead about that. And the now, HOAs aren't, aren't always so willing to accept. Uh, pennies on the dollar of what they owe. They they want the money they're owed, and they yep. rarely will negotiate that. Isn't that true? Some are some are easier to to deal with. I like it when there's an attorney involved. You know, yeah. start to know these attorneys. But uh, sometimes you're just with a with a, a homeowner uh, association president who, you know, <laughs> they get a little full of themselves and they want yeah. all the money. You know, and and so we we're pretty good at at getting them to see some reason. So if it's if it's just Four or five thousand dollars, and I got twenty five hundred from the from the lender. You know, I'm going in saying, "Hey, look, you know, we tried to get your five thousand dollars, but that we got, you know, we got twenty five hundred. Isn't that awesome? And we've got a new buyer that's going to be ready, willing, and able to pay your homeowners association going forward. This is great. All we need is a is a you know is a is a release from you saying this is okay. And usually they'll go along with it. But if they don't, we've got twenty five hundred we have to come up with. So. Now, the one thing that, that's interesting, if you're talking about other states, now North and South Carolina are not called the what's called super lean states. So that's the way we have to deal with the homeowners association. It's just in third or fourth position, you know, and the banks mm -hmm. are not like um, wanting to pay those if they don't have to. You mm -hmm. get a, a super lean state like Florida, if they are in default, it jumps ahead of the mortgage. Like, like taxes. It comes in first position. So like they taxes, have to pay. So they're, they, they have parameters around it, but in Florida and some other super lean states, they're, they're conditioned, the lenders are conditioned to pay that, but not in every state. So let me ask you a question about, about um, the process, beginning of the process. Yeah. Do homeowners have to have their short sale approved by the lender before I can go ahead and list the property? How do we, how do we determine value? Um, two questions. Uh, Value and should they get a, a pre-approval? There is no pre-approval. That's a fantasy. 
Right. So let's be really clear on that. Uh, I've written several articles on this alone. Uh, the fastest way to foreclosure is to call up your lender, do exactly what they say. <laughs> Guarantee you're going to be foreclosed on because they're you're talking to the phone bank. They're going to be reading off of a list. They're going to have you bring five documents. You need seventeen plus five from the lender, uh, five from the listing agent, and five or six from the buyer. You need twenty-seven documents to get through and have an approval on the end. Every short sale. Every time you need a full complete short sale package, but they're going to get you started with just five documents and they're going to get you in a document collection merry-go-round that will easily eat up six months when it should be 60 to 90 days. So okay. um, don't let them think, don't let them talk you into um, getting any pre-approval because there is no pre-approval because I get that phone call all the time. Oh, I've talked to my bank and I've talked to my lender, my loan servicer, and I gave them the five documents and, um, and, and I'm in the short sale program. There is no short sale program. Everybody in the world is in the short sale program. You just have to give them documents and the requirements for, for a short sale. And then they will review it. If you, if they can check the boxes, they will, if they, they, can't, they won't. It's that easy. I never, never contact a, a loan servicer before I have everything. The first you, want, you want the whole package. You want the, you want a contract and you want all of the things that go with it to be able to get it approved. There's no, right. The, when, the, you, when you see lender approved short sale, like if I see them listed, that is more of a case where we had an approval, but it didn't close. So we sort of know what the bank's looking for at that point. Yeah. So if you've gone through a short sale and we got it approved and they didn't close, well, now you know what number they're going to have. You still have to start over from the beginning with a whole new uh, package of documents, but it's been approved once. And, right. if, and there's a difference. Now, if I just got it approved last week and I'm still, you know, and they allow me 45 days to close and we lose them and put someone else in, in that 45 days, the likelihood is I'm going to get really get through the process really quickly and and close very quickly. So that's a really beautiful time to be in as a buyer. But if you got a lender approval six months ago, you're starting over from the beginning. Maybe they'll use that price. Maybe they won't. The so as far as determining value, um, so that that's where I come in. Yeah. Um, and, and so I want I want I would rather you you describe how how I arrive at my value. What 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 does my value need to be? Okay, so. For a successful short sale, you need four things. Number one, most important, you have to have a market price value. You have to have a market price offer on the table. And I'll talk about that in a sec. The other two, you have to be 31 days late on payments. There's one exception to that really, and that's that's a VA loan. Um, number, number three, you have to have the full participation of whoever's on the loan. So if there's a divorce, and they're both on the loan. It doesn't matter if one party deeded it to the other. Both have to 100% participate or there is no short sale. And that just means give those documents that I keep talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a document heavy process. There is no short sale without them. The fourth is you must have an involuntary hardship. There are five involuntary hardships. Curtailment of income. That means a financial hiccup. That's what we're going to see. That's what we almost always see. Um, uh, a medical issue in the family a divorce, a death in the family, and relocation. We're gonna see that too, relocation more than 75 miles away. You just need any one of these, or you're know, gonna have more than one. You just need one of those. It's a very low bar, and you have to write the proper hardship letter. So those are the four requirements. Back to market price offer. What's a market price offer? What it isn't is whatever some buyer is willing to pay. Mm -hmm. That is fantasy land. Um, it, it is, as far as these lenders are concerned, you know, again, remember, we're dealing with a loan servicer most of the time, even if it's Wells Fargo, City, Chase, those are there's a loan, loan servicers servicing a Fannie Mae, a Freddie Mac, an FHA, some other loan owned by some other entity. So they're loan, they're servicing the loan, they're loan servicers. And then there's a whole dozens of other loan servicers, SPS, um, Mr. Cooper, Flagstar, all these are, these are uh, <laughs> loan servicers. Um, so remember that we're dealing with an entity that doesn't own the loan. They've got boxes to check and they will be audited. They're not going to they're not going to give you something they're not allowed to give you. 
First requirement, market price offer. They are going to send a, a, a real estate agent to do a B, BPO, a broker price opinion, mm -hmm. or an appraisal to do a full appraisal on it. They're going to send someone to establish what that value is. Um, and that's going to be based on the comps. And they're not going to take 20% off because it's a short sale. Unless, unless, unless there is... Um, work that needs to be done. It's it's in a, a deficient state where there's no kitchen or or there's. Right. But there's a way to approach that. So when you're just looking at it, the first thing I ask the real estate agent is when you drive up to the house without even seeing the inside and you pull the comps and your computer and your car, where are the sold comps? And the only one I really care about is where's my low number? I don't care what the high number is. You're always going to get a range from here to here. Here's my Here's my sold comp range based on other properties in the area that have sold in the last six months. That's mm -hmm. what's going on. That's your range. And mm -hmm. unless there's some extraordinary circumstances, you got to stay in that range. So mm -hmm. at the short sale, we're probably going to be over towards the low end. So I want to know what's our low number that we can't go below. Every buyer wants to go sit on that low number and then start subtracting for right. carpet and paint and other cosmetic things. You can't do that. If you go to the low comp, you walk into that property and look at it, it's already in pretty sad shape to start with. They've already compensated you for all the cosmetic stuff you're going to have. So okay. sit on the low comp. That's what you need. Now, you mentioned some properties that are not in such great um, condition. That's fine. If it's a serious condition, we call it major issues. There are five major issues that we can use to go below that low comp. The first one is a roof issue. So you've got a roof issue that's pretty serious. Um, water damage from that roof issue, mold from that roof issue, a structural issue. And that can be a bunch of things like a deck can be structural. Even siding can be structural. Certainly anything underneath the house, structural. Um, and the last one is HVAC. So you can see nowhere in there is foggy window or gutters or grass needing cut mm -hmm. or a, a, a swimming pool that needs, you know, cleaning. You know, these a living kitchen would be considered structural, correct? Yeah, part, yeah, yeah structural. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not it's not carpet and paint and, and updating yeah. kitchen cabinets and all that other stuff. It's serious stuff. Now, if you've got a roof issue and the HVAC is shot, that's pretty standard. We see that more probably those two more than anything. Mm -hmm. then how do we get those in the conversation? Remember, we're thinking, we're putting on our our Mr. Cooper glasses, because Mr. Cooper's our loan servicer. How are they going to look at it? And that's all that matters. Not what we have in our head. What do they have in their head? That's the way we have to approach it. And they're going to send an appraiser or BPO agent to the property. That's our only opportunity to bring this in. So we got to be way ahead of them. You would do the you do the sold comps and you say, see, my, my sold comps here are 175 to 300. So 175 is our number. But then you say, Steve, there's a bunch of stuff here. Um, we got a roof issue and some other things, and I know the HVAC is is out. So you get a home inspection, and the home inspection comes back with 25 things and two major issues, a roof and an, and an HVAC. Great. Now we've got it documented. They have to look at it. Um, and so then we go get some estimates from our local roofers, and it's $10,000. It's pretty average, about $10,000 and about $10,000 for a brand new HVAC system, which we absolutely need here. Mm -hmm. Great, that's twenty thousand dollars. We can go now to the low comp of two seventy five, and subtract twenty thousand dollars. Now our number is two fifty five. Period. That's it. It's it's a it's a number you don't want to cross. But in order to do that, I have to have that evidence because when they send the BPO agent or the appraiser to the property, who's meeting them there? Well, the list agent, the expert on that particular property, the expert in the area. They have all the information that these people need. And we want them there. The lockbox is off. So mm -hmm. who gets in there without you? And then you have the comps, just like you've always done. You have the comps listed on, 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 the, kitchen, on the kitchen counter. You have the listing agreement, the, the showing appointments, and, and all the, all the um, uh, comments. You have the offer to purchase. You have, um, did I mention the home inspection? You got that home inspection and then the estimates. And then I like to have a separate sheet of paper that says, comps minus 10 minus mm -hmm. 10 for the HVAC right, right, right. equals 
and do the math for them sitting there as well. So you want to do all that stuff, especially if it's a BPO agent, because mm -hmm. they often come parachuting into your market from mm -hmm. another state. Yeah, yeah. All right. So my next question is, um, why is it important to work with an agent that works with somebody like you as opposed to, I mean, we see agents all the time who negotiate the short sales. And I'll be honest, in the early days, I did it myself as well. What is the benefit of, of me working, partnering with you to do the short sale negotiation instead of doing it myself? Um, we will get this closed nine and a half to 10 out of 10 times. And some of the best agents that have done several of them before will probably close three to four out of 10. That's the reason. If you want to get this thing closed, then that it, it's, it's that important. These are not easy. Right now, it's harder than it has ever, ever been. And I've been doing short sales for more than 10 years. They don't want to do short sales right now. They've got mm -hmm. buyers for every one of these foreclosures. So they are running to foreclosure. Mm -hmm. so you've got to make them stop and push them to do a short sale. And how do you do that? Where you give them everything up front, stand over them, make them check the boxes and say, oh, I guess I checked all the boxes. Where's my where's my letter? Otherwise, they're in control. If you think you're going to learn how to do this and call them up and do it, <laughs> and got another thing coming. It's not happening. You're going to get eaten up. They're going to waste all this time. You're going to get a document collection merry-go-round. In the meantime, here comes foreclosure and it just it just runs them over. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you have relationships and know the, the, the who to contacts with almost any lender that we can deal with. Yeah. Correct. We've been doing it so long. If there's a, if there's something new, we're always trying to look on every file. What can we learn from this file? Oh, there's a, new, there's a new loan servicer in town. Let's find out who they are. And then we take notes on them and now we know them and know who our escalation contacts are and everything else. So now, you've got right there the, the, the back door to just about everybody. It they're gonna they're gonna take us a little more seriously, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But like for instance, I hear a lot of times that that real estate agents that do short sales right before closing, they uh, they come to the the servicer comes to them wants to cut your commission. They've never we've been doing this for ten years. Yes, if you get up to five a uh, million dollars, they're gonna want to pay five percent commission a lot of the time. We always go in at six. Yes, mm -hmm. if you dig into the regulations and the rules in an FHA and a Fannie Mae and, and, and uh, USDA, if you have both sides of the deal, it says they can pay four or five percent. We always ask for six and almost always get it. They have never come to us right before closing and say, we want to renegotiate the, the agent's commission. They know better. They know that that's, that's what is in the guidelines and mm -hmm. we're not going to let that happen. So we protect your commission. Um, another interesting thing is some states, North Carolina, one of them, it is the practice of law to negotiate short sales, to negotiate debt. It's not the practice of law necessarily in South Carolina. So you'll get more people, you know, jumping in there and thinking they can do this. But in North Carolina, it's the it's the practice of law. But the biggest reason is not that the biggest reason is, do you want this to be successful? And again, most of the time I'm free. Why on earth would you not want, you don't want to do this. If you, don't, if you don't know how to do this and you don't have a system and you don't have a staff that's done thousands of them. You right. don't want to get involved in this. This will eat you alive. And you'll, and the, and the worst thing is you won't love short sales and short sales are awesome. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool for people that are underwater and you won't touch them again. If you get involved in one of these mm -hmm. like yourself. Yeah. And that's what I was coming to next was like, again, to reiterate my commission and your fee, is paid from the proceeds of, of the short sale. It's not something that the seller has to come to the table with in addition. And if we don't get it closed, I'm reiterating what you said earlier, if it does not close, I don't get paid and you don't get paid. And that's right. the end of the story. Usually the seller is guaranteeing me a minimum fee. That's yeah. how I've done it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have an upfront fee. I don't get paid. Like we said, I don't get paid unless we close. But mm -hmm. if we close, the seller is usually guaranteeing us a minimum fee. And the minimum fee is usually $2,500. And that's what it costs me. It actually cost me that or more to do a short sale. So that means if we're successful and the bank doesn't pay me, then I'm not going to lose my shirt on this. At least I will cover my cost. So that's a pretty, pretty nice deal. You just cover my cost. But most of the time, I'm going to get the bank to pay me closing costs. They usually pay 3% closing costs. 
if the seller, if the buyer is getting a loan, then I'm going to get those closing costs. They go to the buyer and the buyer just pays me a fee out of that. It's pretty sweet. We don't hide that from the banks. They understand right. that. That's so the you way. charge the buyer, but then, but then you give them the credit so that they're not actually paying. It's a pass through. They get, they get $4,000 and they pay me whatever I ask for. Maybe I leave $200 or $500 on the table for the buyer. So, mm. you know, they're in, in, in the, in, in the money. So they pay me, you know, 3,500 or 3,800 or something like that. In the dozens that you and I have done together, I don't think we have ever had a situation where your fee wasn't covered. Right. It's covered most of the time. I have to tell, I mean, I'm not trying to hide it or anything because, right, right. you know, I can't do this in case if everyone gets what they want, I can't contribute $2,800 of my money and, right. you know, and, and watch everyone else get what I have to at least cover what it costs me to do that. I don't, you know, I would like to get more and that's where the closing cost comes in. And, and to be clear, that that fee is only, um, they're only liable for that fee if we get to the closing and the bank doesn't pay. If it does not close, you and I get a big zero. Get nothing. It, and, and in North Carolina, South Carolina is the same thing, but a little bit different. In North Carolina, they can, the buyer can walk at any time. It's in the North Carolina short sale addendum. They can walk because it's raining outside. Yeah. And, you know, they do. And so we can be two weeks in, um, six weeks in, we could have it approved and on our way to closing and the, and the buyer can go, oh, never mind. Yeah. So that's only North Carolina, not so, so, I'm in South Carolina. So let's talk about South Carolina. Um, South Carolina, if they walk, um, just like North Carolina, if they walk, it just means back on the market, start over. And then, you know, hopefully we get to the closing table on the second one. And then we would we would get our fee. But yeah, South Carolina has in their short sale addendum, you have to put a hard date. Right. And it says, I believe that if uh, you if you don't have it approved 30 days prior to that, then they can walk. So you mm -hmm. want to put that date way out. So it, it right. gives you a chance to do it. Because again, it's going to take 60 to 90 days. Right. And I, this isn't on my list of questions, but you, you made me think of this. So in South Carolina, we write the contract. We negotiate the contract. Um, if I'm a listing agent, I'm negotiating with the buyer's agent. And we are negotiating that contract in the same format as um, and using the same contingencies, just as the buyer would have a contingency that their loan be approved and that they get their loan. We would have a contingency for the seller that the short sale is approved. At that point, the buyer is bound to whatever the dates and all of that because the lender, the or the lender or lender of the creditors are not actually parties to the to the the contract itself. We're negotiating buyer and seller, listing agent and buyer's agent, just like any other transaction. Right. Yeah. Short sale addendum is there's always a short sale addendum, and in South Carolina, it's different than the North Carolina one. So right. in that one, it does say that you know if it doesn't, if the transaction doesn't get approved, then obviously. It's not going to close and, and the buyer gets their money back. But it does say that at a certain point, if you don't have it approved, then the buyer can terminate at that point. But they yeah. are they are in it, you know, to start with. So it is. Uh, it's, uh, I know some buyers think that, well, you know, I can get out of this at any time because the short sale isn't approved yet. So I can just if I find something better, I can go. And that, and that is not the case. So it's one of those things. Carolina, that absolutely is the case. And, it, and, but again, we don't, you know, with cash buyers, um, you see that, that a lot more than with buyers that are, that are, have a loan attached. You don't yeah. see that. Um, about how long does a short sale take if there's just one lender, one, one creditor? Well, the first loan is usually the one that takes the longest. So whether, you know, it, so if there's a first, um, your first mortgage is underwater, it's going to take 60 to 90 days. That's pretty standard, 60 to 90 days if you know what you're doing and, mm -hmm. and you do everything right and you've given the package up ahead. Um, mm -hmm. It's usually a 60 to 90 day process. Okay. Um, there's a second and, and let's say that the first is not underwater, it's just a second. We might get it done in, in 60 days or maybe even a little bit less. You know, okay. it just depends on who that, it, it always depends on who the lender is. Can you negotiate simultaneously with all of the creditors or do you have to do one and then the next and then the next? Most of the time we can do it simultaneously. We have had some this year where they say, well, come to me 
when you've got the other guy. I've had that from the second position and I've had it from the first position. Hmm. So you could get into a situation where it might take a little bit longer simply because you've got one or the other, you know, being a pain in the neck, you know, saying, hmm. oh no, you've got to give us the second approval before we'll give you our approval. Um, hmm. But we almost, almost always are doing it simultaneous. Just like the IRS tax lien, we used to do that simultaneously. We knew hmm. we had one, let's go negotiate it now. They won't let you do that. You have to have approvals from everybody and you have to have an appraisal. Remember, it has to be a market price offer. When you have an IRS tax lien, that's another entity out there that's requiring a market price offer and you have to prove it. So you got to get way ahead on that one. IRS tax lien, first thing you do is get an appraisal. Mm -hmm. And that's the number you have to have because mm -hmm. you can get it all approved by the first and the second and even judgments and you go to the IRS, they go, nope, mm -hmm. nope. You've got, uh, you show me the approval, I mean, the appraisal, the appraisal says it's 200 and you've got a 180 offer here. Mm. Not going to give it to you. So you've got to, you have to know what's coming and plan your way through. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, this is the biggest question. How important is it for the homeowners to consult either their accountant or another tax specialist before they start the short sale process? Well, when we do it, I don't, it's, it's nice if they've already consulted with them, but mm -hmm. my requirement on every short sale as well is they have a, a, a consult with a CPA or a tax attorney prior to closing. And why is that? It's because we got those deficiencies. Let's say there's $20,000 deficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I, we just did one on the Outer Banks and we got $1.5 million forgiven of wow. deficiencies. Jeez, had a million dollar offer and boy, he didn't, Ooh. it had never come back. But um, so if you've got deficiencies and we get them forgiven, you're going to get a 1099 because forgiveness of debt is a taxable event as far as the IRS is concerned. And there's no negotiating out of it. So you don't want to have a surprise next tax season when you say, what do you mean? I had a $20,000 um, 1099. Where did that come from? Well, you've got $20,000 worth of debt forgiven. Here's your 1099. And you have to, it's in, it's, it's, it's as if you had income. So you pay income tax on that. So if you've got a big deficiency, $1.5 million, you better do some tax planning and be ready for that. Cause that's a big, a big, a big thing. Um, but I always consider a 1099 a good thing mm -hmm. because you don't get a 1099 if you have a credit union and you're paying them back over monthly and monthly fees over seven to 10 years. You know, they didn't forgive anything. There's no 1099. Give me a 1099. That means they forgave that $20,000. I'll pay taxes on $20,000 all day long as opposed to pay $20,000. Exactly. And that, that actually, that 1099 issue, people may think, oh, well, I'll just go to foreclosure then and, and it'll be gone. And if the bank forgives it in that situation, you get the same 1099 either way. The, there are three options, a short sale, a deed in lieu of foreclosure. It's the same thing as a short sale. There's just no buyer. You're going through the same process and there's a deficiency associated with that. If it goes to foreclosure, there's a deficiency associated with that. At foreclosure, they're either going to come after you for a judgment or they're going to forgive the debt. And if usually it's it, the general rule is if in a short sale, they forgive debt, they're probably going to forgive debt at the, at the courthouse steps. The problem is it's just going to be bigger. So you're not avoiding it. So maybe if you do a short sale, you get a market price offer, you go through all this, there's a $20,000 deficiency. At the foreclosure, it could be $40,000. So you didn't get anything. Now you're dragging a foreclosure around for seven years. That's not going to be pretty. And you've got a 1099 that's twice as big as if you had done a short sale. And a short sale is only, you know, one to three years. It's gone in about three to four years. So mm -hmm. huge, huge difference in short sale and foreclosure. And the 1099 is just one of those differences. So when you talked about the, the short sale being gone, you're talking about as far as reporting on credit and having it having a negative effect on their credit, correct? Right. The, the big deal is um, how is this going to affect you moving forward? And the short sale is not going to affect your credit score very much um, going forward. Why? Because you have to be late on payments to, to even do it. You have to be 31 days late just to submit your package. So even if you're just 31 days late, you're going to be four or five months late by the time we're, we get to closing. 
Mm -hmm. four or five months of missed payments, you are in the basement. You're already in the high fives. Mm -hmm. you know, you're down there quickly. So the short sale will probably have more of a positive effect. A lot of times, once you're down and in, in the basement, as far as you're going uh, and you do a short sale, all the negative pressure has been released. The foreclosures dismissed. It's, re it's related uh, to the credit uh, companies as paid in full. In the trade line, it says took less than borrower owed or settled, but it's reported as paid in full. So all the negative pressure on your credit score is released. So a lot of times what happens is you get a nice little bump up 60 days, 30 days after a short sale because it's all been reported and mm -hmm. now you're starting your, your, your trek up again. So the short sale doesn't affect your credit that much, but what it is affected is your ability to get another loan in the future. Right. So if you've got a short sale, you're not going to get another loan for one to three years. Usually it depends on who you're getting your loan from. They've got their guidelines. Oh, if you had a short sale, the seasoning requirement for FHA is three years. Mm -hmm. So it depends on, on who you're getting your loan from. They're going to have their guidelines. It's usually one to three years. There are a couple of products out there that require four years of seasoning, but usually it's one to three years. A deed in lieu, three to five years of seasoning before you're going to get another home loan from these. Mm -hmm. A foreclosure, five to seven years. Mm -hmm. Sit on the sidelines, you're done. Mm -hmm. for and on top of that, you're going to drag that, for, that foreclosure around with you everywhere you go. So that means any bank, institution, financial, mm -hmm. anybody that has anything to do with finances um, mm -hmm. is going to know that. And from teller on up, you mistreated a bank and they're not happy about it. And they're a little reluctant to trust you and go forward because you do drag that around a short sale night and day. OK. And um, another question I know a lot of people wonder um, the foreclosure department or the delinquency department and the short sale department in, at a lender is two totally different animals. So you could be in the process of negotiating a short sale, but there's still also a foreclosure proceeding that's pending. And I know it doesn't happen often, but it can be that the, the foreclosure department continues on and forecloses before you have actually negotiated a short sale. Correct. Oh, absolutely. You know, and in, they, they're two separate departments. And this is why in, you know, I, I wrote the fastest way to foreclosure is do what they say, because what happens is the seller calls them up, talks to the phone bank and says the word short sale. And they read on the screen. Oh, you said short sale. Therefore, you must give me this and this and this and this and send it to this. All that's going to do is going to you send them those documents. It's going to trigger the valuation. So you're going to get the valuation early. And you're not going to be there with all that stuff that we talked about. Right. And so they're probably going to value it too high and probably shoot yourself in the foot. But even mm -hmm. if everything goes great, you get an offer, you go in, um, you're talking to the phone bank and you have nothing. There is no short sale program here. But in your mind, hey, I'm in the short sale program. I got mm -hmm. someone with the loan servicer that's watching my back. I've mm -hmm. got a partner. His name is Bob and I'll never get Bob on the phone again. <laughs> <laughs> but yet you, you're lulled into a sense of complacency thinking that you got this wired. In the meantime, different, uh, you know, let's say it's Wells Fargo, different building, different state. The foreclosure department is, is, is doesn't even know you exist in the, in the with loss mitigation. And loss mitigation department, which is where the short sale is, doesn't know you exist because just because you sent in a few documents from the phone bank and triggered a, a BPO doesn't mean anything. You don't get into loss mitigation. So you've got an offer and 27 documents. Mm -hmm. then they'll take you seriously. Then they will assign you a number. Then they will give you a negotiator. And now you're negotiating a short sale. But until then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you think you're somewhere and you're not. And that that's by design and right. they just run you over with foreclosure. And you're going to go, what just happened? I thought I was doing a short sale. Yeah. They're not going to stop the shorts, the foreclosure because you have a desire to do a short sale. And even right now, I mean, back in 2012, where they kind of wanted to do a short sale versus a foreclosure, you get a package in, you know, they would hold off the foreclosure. Now they don't do that. You've got to get it in and start immediately asking them to stop the foreclosure. And they're not going to until they do the valuation, which happens in the first three weeks of the short sale usually. And it looks like you're going to go forward. Then at some point, the loss mitigation department might pick up the phone or send an email over to the foreclosure department and say, hey, chill. 
Mm -hmm. we're going to be doing a short sale here, but it does not happen just because you sent them a package. It's down the road when it starts to look like it's, it's going, I have some that go all the way, you know, I am negotiating all that and I've got an approval in my hand and the foreclosure hasn't been canceled. And then they just put it on hold and mm -hmm. they say, Okay, let's see if they're going to close. Right. If you don't close in time, man. They're they're on it again. So right, right. they are aggressive here. You have to keep yeah. an eye on that foreclosure. And just to just to put a little caveat out there, in the current time that we're in, because we're recording this in the middle of the quarantine, yeah. all, all foreclosures are, are halted right, for right now. But we, we're talking about going forward right. after we finish this dilemma and this pandemic, and we're back to life. All yeah. of the we're talking about yes. everything, all foreclosures. Um, throughout North Carolina and I'm sure South Carolina and most yeah. other states are stopped at this point. Everything is on hold. Right. When this kicks in, you know, like in three, four, five months, we have no idea what's coming. But yeah. if it gets back to a quote unquote normal, um, then you know we'll we'll have to see. But most of the time, you've got to keep an eye on that foreclosure. And that's why I wanted to do this video. It's premature for sure. But if people, you know, sometimes people like me start thinking about the what ifs way before it actually happens and so i thought it would be helpful to have to have some information out there about them do you you said you wrote an article do you have something that i can attach to this later um that people can download and and, and look at for some guidelines and things uh, uh, wildlawfirm.com you can go to my website all all okay. the articles and questions and, and information is there it's it's quite extensive wonderful i will post that along with the video wildlawfirm.com and I, those are all the questions that I have. Did I miss anything? No, I think you you were you were thorough. I think we've we've covered just about everything. Well, we've got enough short sales together. I, I you know I know I know what the advantage of working with you is. Um, like I said, I, I used to do these myself back before I, I met you, and they're tedious and they take a lot of my time. And I'm not an attorney, and I don't have the back door to all of the lenders like you do. And so negotiating these using you as my partner is best for me and way best for my clients. So um, I'm thankful I got to meet you. Just not cost effective for even other attorneys, but certainly mm -hmm. not cost effective for, for a real estate agent to take this on because it is a lot of work, far mm -hmm. more than you think when you just call the phone bank up and say, I only need five right. documents. Right. That's not true. It's going to be 27 documents, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. so, it's just not cost effective, but we have a system. This is all we do. Now, if I was doing divorces, I certainly wouldn't want to take this on. Closing attorneys, you know, they they dip their toe in and they get burned a couple of times, and they don't they don't touch them. So too much work for them too. Yeah. How many, how many attorneys and staff do you have in your office? Um, right now, I have one attorney and one paralegal, but they've been with me forever, and they could handle a huge number of of files. And if you need more, then I will just staff up. It's it's because uh, the process is the same, and mm -hmm. the infrastructure is here. We can handle as many as we need. We would just okay. hire uh, you know, another um, negotiator. Perfect. Well, Steve, I really really appreciate you doing this video with me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna post it out in some places so that people can watch it later. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, and we will talk again soon. Yeah, call me. Uh, if, if a real estate, the big thing that I would, I think the takeaway here is if you're a real estate agent and you've got a short sale or if you're a seller, a homeowner and you have a, you know, have a, have a situation you're not really sure of, call me. I'm mm -hmm. happy to talk to you. I love talking short sales. And so we'll go through it. I'm a resource. Please use me. Do you have, um, do you have referral partners in other states that you can um, refer people to if it's something that you personally can't handle or can you do every state? I can do the short sale aspect of every state. Cool. There's, there's just not that many. You know, if I if you came to me and say, hey, I have a short sale in Arizona. Do you know anybody? I'm like, there's very there are very few people that that do what I do. So I don't know anybody there, but I can handle the short sale. I would just, again, make sure there's a closing attorney there. Okay. It's no different. Wonderful. Well, that's good to know. All right. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I said, I never see clients, even in Asheville, if there's a short sale here, it's yeah. all on the phone and telephone. So there's no difference at all. Yeah. And you can even do face to face like this now with all this technology. If people yeah. wanted to, they wanted to see who they were dealing with. Yeah. We'll probably end up doing a lot of these now with console. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Steve, it's been great talking with you and uh, I'll be talking to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fun. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon.
Bye. Bye-bye.